Welcome to our first video in our series on what's going to be vertebrate diversity. In our last series of videos, we worked our way up through the invertebrate animals, from the sponges to the jellyfish to the flatworms to the roundworms, through our protostome branch, and then we ended with our deuterostome branch uh, and ended with a brief discussion on chordates. In this series of videos, we're going to focus in on the chordate uh, phylum and more specifically, in greater detail, uh, to the vertebrate subphylum. Before we get into details of the vertebrates, we need to remind ourselves what we learned in our last video of the invertebrates, and that is, what is a chordate? To be in the phylum chordata, an animal at some point in its life must have the fo following four characteristics. A notochord, a structural rod or, or, that runs down its dorsal surface to give the animal a structural support, a hollow dorsal nerve cord that it runs uh, to behind the notochord and dorsal to that. It's formed from ectoderm and will give rise to the nervous system, the uh, brain and the spinal cord. They All the chordates have at some point paired slits, uh, gill slits in the pharynx across which sometimes gas exchange can occur, but also filter feeding in some of the chordates. And finally, the fourth chordate characteristic is that all chordates, at some point during their development, have a tail. So this is our generic chordate, and uh, this defines the phylum. As we move through the phylum chordata, we're going to focus in on certain anatomical and adaptive changes that allowed for animals to make the transitions uh, that we see. We're going to go through this in a similar way that we went through our discussion on plant diversity and evolution. Specifically, we're going to look at changes in gas exchange systems, circulatory systems, skeletal systems, nervous systems, and reproductive systems. And we're going to relate each of these to lifestyle and habitat. But we're going to start by taking a closer look at the subphyla within uh, the chordates, the urochordata, the cephalochordata, and the vertebrata, and what makes each uh, unique. When we look at the subphylum urochordata, this is probably the most unusual of the chordates. It certainly doesn't look like anything that we would relate to ourselves, yet this animal is the same phylum that we belong to as humans, and that's kind of hard to, to take in. They look very non-animal-like. Uh, the common name for these animals are tunicates or sea squirts, and when we look at kind of how they behave, that, that name looks uh, pretty, pretty apropos. But uh, the interesting thing is when we look at the adult sea squirt, the only chordate characteristic that we see are the gill slits. And you can't see them in this picture because they're on the inside. But these are sessile animals. They're filter feeders. We know from our discussion on the uh, invertebrates that sessile filter feeders typically don't have a head. There's no concentration of sensory systems um, uh, or feeding structures in the anterior end. But they don't need one. They will pull water in uh, across their gill slits and out and siphon off or filter out the microscopic particles of food or the small particles of food. Um, but we have to look at the larval stages in order to kind of see the chordate nature of these animals. And when we look at the larva, we see all four chordate characteristics. We have our notochord, we have our nerve cord that runs down the back side, our dorsal nerve cord. We have the gill slits, the pharynx, across which they filter feed and, and have gas exchange, and we have uh, a tail. Uh, we have the head region. So these free-swimming larvae at some point uh, mature into the adult, but the larva shows all four of our chordate characteristics. As they metamorph or change uh, into the adult, they lose these structures. The notochord uh, goes away, starts to degenerate. The nerve cord also uh, degenerates, and the tail uh, goes away as they change into their adult form. Uh, the gill slits, which they use as filter feeders when they're free swimming, uh, become also for filter feeding gas exchange in the adult form. When we move to the subphylum cephalochordata, uh, there's really not a lot to talk about. The common name is lancet, which means thin blade, a specific name or a specific type as an amphioxus. And this is the picture we've been using as our generic chordate because the cephalochordates really do give us a glimpse as to what um, kind of the, um, the ancestor to all chordates must have looked like. It's the only 
uh, chordate that retains all four chordate characteristics as an adult. So we kind of use this as our generic uh, chordate, and it's in the subphylum cephalochordata. And that brings us to the subphylum vertebrata. Now the vertebrata are the chordates that we may be more familiar with. They include the class Agnatha, Chondrichthys, Osteichthys, Amphibia, Reptiles, Aves, and Mammals. Aves are birds, of course. And so these are the animals that are the vertebrates that we're more familiar with. A couple of these names may not seem familiar, and Agnatha will probably uh, be kind of new for some of us. But uh, once we describe what Chondrichthys and Osteichthys are, then I think it'll be real clear uh, those animals are very familiar to us. But you can see here, I just have uh, the notes from your note packet, but uh, there's not much to say here except that in each of these groups we're going to go into more detail um, as we move from class to class. This is what the interesting uh, part is going to be, is to compare how we change in these, um, in these details as we move up uh, from group to group. But the one thing that we need to discuss is file subphylum vertebrata what's the defining feature of the vertebrates? And it, it may seem obvious, but uh, it's the presence of a vertebra. The notochord is replaced by uh, a backbone. Now, I said uh, backbone, but we have to be careful because this vertebrae or these vertebrae are not always made of bone. Sometimes they're made of uh, cartilage, so it's cartilage or bone. And as soon as we say that, uh, we're going to have one exception right off the bat where we have an animal that is a vertebra that actually doesn't have vertebra. Uh, but we'll see how that still fits in. So if we look at the, the skeletal system of all of vertebrates, we can kind of look at a generic uh, uh, picture of what the vertebrate skeleton looks like and then kind of show how uh, from group to group it, it differs a little bit. So if we look at this uh, these description here, the general vertebrate skeleton and uh, um, beware my artwork here, but we have an axial skeleton or the axis of the body which includes uh, some kind of skull, uh, my skull, um, and a vertebra or backbone, right? or it could be again made of bone but uh, could be made of cartilage and coming off of that vertebra will be ribs which are bone or again uh, cartilage that are protecting some of the internal organs think about your rib cage around your your upper torso area and so we have this axial skeleton that makes up the axis of the body you know the the, the, we, the front and back axis but we also, in many of the vertebrates, have what we call the appendicular skeleton, and think ap appendicular, think appendages. And so we have, uh, in many of the vertebrates, a pectoral girdle and a pelvic girdle. And these are skeletal elements that help us attach any limbs. You know, all the four limbs, you know, legs or wings, would attach to the pectoral girdle. In your body, think your collarbone and your shoulder blades. And the pelvic girdle to help us attach any legs that we might have. Think in your body, think hip bones. Now, with that wonderful piece of art, let me move to a better picture. Here's the skeletal system of a frog, and we can see the axial skeleton, uh, the skull, right? and the vertebrae and the ribs. There's the axial skeleton. And the appendicular skeleton includes the pectoral girdle with the limbs attached, and the pelvic girdle with the hind limbs attached. So it gives you a good idea of our generic vertebrate uh, skeleton. And if we look at this picture, we see uh, uh, that all vertebrates are kind of built off this model of the uh, generic vertebrate skeleton and that kind of defines the group for us. Now let's build a classification key like we did with plants and then the invertebrates uh, for the vertebrates. And if we just start with the bottom part here, the, the chordates uh, being the top of our old tree. All right, so here we are at the top of the tree we started to make for animals. And we're going to build off of this uh, a new tree with the chordates now at the bottom so that uh, our branch down to the deuter stones would be down here. Uh, and we have our urochordata and our cephalochordata, but really want to focus on the vertebrate branch. So we have our notochord replaced by a vertebrae for, to make the vertebrates. So for you, I'd start with this, and a blank piece of paper, and start at the bottom and give yourself room to work up. We're going to build up off of the vertebrates. Let me move this down. So what's the first question we need to ask? Well, interestingly, the first question we need to ask is, does this vertebrate have a jaw or not? 
If the answer is no, then we have a group of vertebrates called the agnathans, or the jawless fish, the prefix a meaning lacking, and nath, g-n-a-t-h, means jaw. If the answer is yes, then we have a group of animals that we're going to call the nathostomes. Stome should be something we're becoming more familiar with. That's, that root means mouth, and nath means jaw. So the animals that are on this branch have a jawed mouth. So the evolution of a jaw is going to be a significant event for us as we move through our vertebrates. The next question we're going to ask once we know that we have a vertebrate with a jaw is, what's the skeleton made of? Is it entirely cartilage, or does it have bone in it? If the answer to that question is cartilage, then we have a group of animals called the chondrichthys. These are the cartilage fish. The uh, root chondri means cartilage, and ichthys means fish. So these are cartilage fish like sharks and stingrays. If this jawed vertebrate has a skeleton made of bone, the next question we have to ask is, does it have limbs or fins? Whoops, let's get rid of that. If it has no legs, let's get rid of this for a second, then it is a fish still, but it's made of bone, so it's an osteichthys, or bony fish. The root osti, or osteo, means bone, and again, ichthys means fish. This stands for bony fish. So our first three classes in the subphylum vertebrata is the class agnatha, class chondrichthys, and osteichthys. They're all fish, jawless fish, cartilage fish, and bony fish. But what if we have limbs or legs? Then we have a group of animals called the tetrapods. And the next question is, do these animals, these vertebrates with legs, have an amniotic egg or not? And we're going to talk a lot about what an amniotic egg is, but this is a major uh, step in the evolution of animals. The amniotic egg allows us to move on to land. So if the answer is no, then we have the amphibians. The amphibians would be a very interesting, interesting case study for us because while they have legs and they, they can live part of their life on land, they don't have an amniotic egg, therefore they have to go to water to reproduce. In fact, the word amphibia means amphi means dual, and bia means life, so dual life, part in water and part on land. That'll be a big part of our discussion. But if we go down this branch of the animals with the amniotic egg, we have a group that we're going to call the amniotes. The amniotes, by definition, will be terrestrial animals, or land animals, because they can lay their eggs on land. The first question we ask with the amniotes is, do they have hair or not? If the answer is yes, then we have the mammals. But if the answer is no, we have to ask an additional question. For those amniotes that lack hair, the question we ask is, feathers? And if the answer is yes, we have our birds. And I'm going to move this down in a minute so you can see the picture. And if the answer is no, we have our reptiles. So let me move this down a little bit. Now, we're going to go one step further with the, uh, with the mammals. We're going to divide mammals up into three subclasses. So class mammalia will have three subclasses. The monotremes, or the egg-laying mammals, the marsupials, and the placentals, which of course we belong to. So that's what we have in front of us. We're going to start with the agnathans, uh, talk about the evolution of the jaw, talk about the chondrichthys, talk about the evolution of bone, uh, talk about the osteichthys, talk about the evolution of limbs. We'll slow down and do a case study on the amphibians being our transition from water to land and discuss what they gain that helps them on, on land but we, where they're limited and why they have to return to water. And then the very large evolutionary step forward of the amniotic egg. We'll talk about the significance of that egg and the structures of it as it allows for these animals that are truly terrestrial. And we'll, within these we'll do reptiles first, uh, then birds, and then we'll finish with mammals. And with these reptiles and birds we'll talk about their similarities, uh, what specific features they have which allow them to adapt to their lifestyles and how they may be limited um, in some respects or or not and then we move to mammals we'll focus in on why we divide these three subgroups the basis of that division and we'll focus on the um, the evolutionary significance of the placenta uh, and that's what we have in front of us to do in the rest of this unit so come back for the series of videos to follow as we explore the diversity of the subphylum vertebrata